now. Well, hopefully, because it seems that they have something to count the minutes and seconds here, but <laughs> it's not working. We will see later, I guess. Um, I got the message, so it's working. Okay, good. Well, then, welcome everyone to this new session of the Unit, Unit Community Hours. First, we have uh, an announcement to do, which is that Pau, who, by the way, is here, I think, yeah, <laughs> is uh, leaving the Susan Manager team to pursue new adventures and a new opportunity. And for the time being, Michael Kalmer is going to be our temporary PO. That said, rest assured that things are not going to change. We will keep the unique community hours. We will keep the same relationship with the community and all the resources that we are already dedicating during the last years. So let's start with the agenda for today. We have the new topics for uni 2021-08 that should be released next month i'm going to present that then frankie and jan are going to talk about the ansible client bootstrapping and the new ansible test mode that will be part of 2021-08 only that that second thing the test mode pablo will present the scap audit ui changes Ricardo will present the new inter-server synchronization version 2 and all the improvements that we have with this new version, which is going to be a technical preview. And finally, Cedric is going to tell us everything about pacemaker support for KVM and Shem, Xem virtual machines. So, well, let's see what is going to be new with the next to uni version. But first, a very big warning, which is that if you are not already on 2021.06, when 2021.08 is going to be released, you will still need to follow the major upgrade procedure. That will be, of course, on the release notes, that will be on the email announcement, and that will be on the website as well. But yeah, try to remember about it because we are changing the base operating system since 2020 2021.05 and earlier from lib15.2 to lib15.3. If you want all the details, they are on the presentations we did for the last uni community hours. So we, add, we are adding support to even more clients. Next one is Rogi Linux 8. It's already on master, seems to be working fine. And well, the support is going to be exactly the same we have for Alma Linux 8. And I was going to say the same as CentOS 8, but no, it's even better because a few days ago, Rocky Linux 8 decided to add the errata information. So that is going to work out of the box, unlike it is for CentOS 8. Then we have the Ansible playbook test mode, which means that you will be able to test your playbooks without actually running them. Jan is going to talk about this later briefly. The Kiwi parameters for the OS image profiles, which is something very useful, is if, for example, you need to pick a profile from a Kiwi, Kiwi file that contains several profiles. Then we have several improvements for ARC64 hosts, including the virtualization until now. Some flags for the CPU were not correctly detected, which means that that is one of the reasons virtualization was not working and Cedric was working very hard to get everything fixed and you will be able to test it with this next to uni version. Then of course, the pacemaker support for KVM and Xen virtual machines, Cedric will talk about it. The new CLM filter template, so you are able to set up live patching based on an, on an existing system. If you want to know the details, you can check the documentation or the presentation by Jan in the last session of the Uni Community Hours. You are now able to create new virtual machines with UEFI from the web UI. We have several open SCAP audit improvements that Pablo is going to describe in, uh, in the next minutes. And as I was telling at the agenda, well, the tech preview for the Intel Server synchronization version two. And 
improvements for Grafana and Prometheus. We have a bump in the version for both products. Um, the list of changes is just way too long to describe it here. So you will be able to check all the changes on these links, or of course, at the release notes, we will include them as well. And well, that's it. We have now some time for questions and answers, but remember that for some of the things, we will have dedicated presentations today. Any questions? Okay, good. Then it's time for Frankie and Jan to talk us to talk to us about Ansible. So let me stop the presentation, and you can share your screen or slides. Um, Julio, uh, yes. I have one bad news that um, Frankie is not available today, and he couldn't join. Um, so he has the machines that has this feature. So unfortunately, we cannot have the demo today. But I could still talk about it at least briefly. Um, so what we were going to um, demo today is um, the future um, of onboarding Ansible clients to SUSE Manager. And it's still in active de uh, development, so it's not merged yet. Um, and it's not available in Uyuni yet. But um, we made good progress with that. So we would expect it to be um, available for one of the following versions. So anyway, it's about, um, so you, we already um, showed in some of the past um, dem demos that um, now we are managing Ansible um, clients now with SUSE Manager, as you know, uh, with Uyuni. And what we added recently is that um, uh, Uyuni now detects um, all the clients that an Ansible controller has in, their, in one of their uh, registered inventory files and we show a list of those clients and then you will have you have the option to select any of these clients and initiate the onboarding process um, up from that point everything goes automatically just like a regular system onboarding it would um, try to do the usual bootstrap process on those clients running some um, some salt states etc and then you would be able to see it as one of your registered clients. So that was the main feature we wanted to talk about today. Um, and in addition to that, um, we enabled um, Ansible playbook execution. We have the, now we have the option to run them in the test mode before you um, before you actually run the thing. It's basically just a dry run. Um, you can activate it via a toggle switch next to the um, execute playbook button. And if you do this, um, you know the we are running the Ansible playbooks via a salt um, salt module, and this module by itself natively supports test mode execution. So as you know, salt also has a test execution mode. So we just passed um, pass these um, parameters to salt, and salt recognizes this and runs the Ansible playbook with um, check and diff parameters. So this effectively um, the check, what check does is um, not to do any changes, but try to act like it's going to changing anything, but without changing anything. And the diff option shows you um, a, a diff of what is going to be actually changed. And this you can see in the result of the action, um, a diff of the potential changes. And yeah, I guess that's uh, what I can say about that. So sorry for the disruption and yeah i hope to have a more detailed demo according uh, with these two features in the upcoming session but i could i think i could still answer some questions if anybody has some okay if that is not the case then Pablo will now talk about this CAP audit UA, UI changes. Thank you very much, Jan. Okay, let me share the screen. I hope you can see the presentation now. Yes. Right, perfect. 
Okay, so yeah, um, as Julio was mentioning, uh, we have been working a little bit on doing some improvements on the uh, SCAP audit we currently have. Uh, so we have actually already pushed some of them, uh, for which would be included on the next UUNI version, so 2021.08, basically. Uh, so yeah, this is just about uh, uh, showing you more or less what we have introduced uh, and which are those changes. So, first of all, we have been working on improvements of the OpenSCAD module of SALT. Um, we, the, the module was um, uh, really minimal, uh, doing minimal thing, and it was basically not allowing us to expand the parameters that we can use for, for when doing the, the, the XCCDF uh, eval command. So we have been working on that. Uh, now Sol has a better OpenSCAD module, and now we are allowing them to, for example, passing some oval files um, in the UI. So when you are scheduling a SCAP audit, then beside of the, 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 the command line uh, parameters, you can now pass an extra yeah, comma-separated list of oval, oval files that we would be used uh, on the OSCAP execution that we are going to trigger. And not only on the UI, but also the XML PC. And um, in the UI itself, um, the command line argument string, we are now basically allowing the following um, uh, yeah, arguments. So you can keep, you can still use the profile one. Then we have added the rule, tailoring file, tailoring ID. This fetch remote resource, which is really important, um, yeah, for allowing or, or yeah, in some context to, to really download all the the resources that we need to 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 run the actual um, profile, and we have also added the remediate. So now you can add the remediate, which would basically um, trigger the remediation scripts using the the I mean by by OSCAP itself. So be careful because this is doing changes on your system when you run this remediate. But now uh, it is possible if you explicitly ask for it. We have already some known issues. Uh, for example, um, depending on the profiles that you are running, you may run uh, with OSCAP uh, process being killed by a system or by the kernel because um, it's running out of memory, it's eating all the memory. Some profiles are actually, uh, yeah, eating quite a lot, like gigabytes of RAM. And the problem is that once, uh, when this happens, the error that we have on the UI is basically this, unexpected error. And what we see on salt, minion, is something like this. So it's not really clear, and we are already working into providing a better error message when a situation like this happens, because you know getting this unexpected error is basically not telling much. So we get a better response here from the, the execution. Then the other one, um, non-issue. We have problems when uh, the, re the report results, the files, the generated XMLs and the, 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 the HTML files are exceeding 100 megabytes. When this happens, the problem is that, uh, again, we get some weird message and then it's not really clear what's happening. But we already have a pull request open um, which is about, this is basically some restriction that is on the Soul Master configuration for files that are uploaded by minions up to the master. So when some of those reports or XMLs are higher than 100 megabytes, then yeah, we get this conflict. This is the default value that is um, configured by Soul Master. So yeah, we are now fixing this situation. And that's basically it. Let me just do and um, sh quickly show you what we, this on the UI. So um, let me try to exit this presentation. Exactly. So yeah, here I have um, my Uni server. And in this case, this is, uh, well, an SLE 15 sp 3 client. I go to audit. These are some of the last execution I did. If I go to schedule, this is the same UI, but as you can see, now we have an extra field here. All file, this is optional. So you can specify some or none. And yeah, this is like, like always. But now here on the command line argument, we can do more stuff. You know, we can pass 
extra things like this. Um, yeah, and then select our, and then even pass some, uh, yeah, whatever oval file like these ones here. And this, well, let me not try to uh, with fetch remote results. And when we do like this, yeah, it will schedule the action as always. Okay, something is going on now. <laughs> I was doing some, okay, I missed that file, sorry. I, I uh, yeah, I used the wrong oval file, which was not existing from my previous test. Let's quickly do it again, just in case. So this is profile standard. This is my 15 TS, this one, and the oval files. So it's like this, yeah, exactly. So if we go to event, then we should see this. We have now the oval files here, and this is in the end passed to the execution, those cap execution that is, uh, yeah, trigger on the client, basically. Now we see it running, and in the end, we will get some result as the ones that we can, we have added here. Yeah. You know, usual result. Here we are. Not, we have not changed anything, but yeah, now you can pass more stuff to the final OSCAP execution and then being able to actually run it properly. So yeah, that's basically it. Uh, I think, yeah, nothing else, just some question if you have. Yeah, so yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo. Welcome. Okay, now Ricardo is going to present the brand new Inter Server Synchronization version two that remember for now, it's going to be only a technical preview, but it's indeed already working. Ricardo. Okay, thank you, Julio. Uh, you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let me just increase the font. So uh, I didn't prepare any slides. I will just show guys you the, the repository and documentation and do a small demo. So in the repository, you can see it's under Uniproject Umbrella and it's named Interserver Sync. And you have uh, several informations in here. Uh, and by the way, I need to remove this because it's not true anymore. Uh, the package is already under the uh, Uni repositories and you have some information about how to use it, okay? And how to connect database and how to configure database connection. But it also have some information in the documentation that will be part of this new uni version. Um, and you can see how to install the package, how to run the export and the import commands, and how to sync all the information between the two servers, okay? If you are using the rsync. So now the demo part. Any, any questions so far? Uh, yeah, so, and let me show how I set up the environment. So this is a environment uh, that I have set up previously. This is the source server. And in this server, we have a content lifecycle manager project. And this project uh, is basically using the SLE product SP2. Uh, with uh, the base system uh, updates in pool and the, the system updates. I'm excluding all the packages from the from these channels and I'm including only the AAA underscore base packages and AAA underscore base um, patches. Regarding the environments, I have two environments, uh, one in version 2 and one in version 1. Uh, I didn't promote the dev environment for production. And what does this mean? So this means that we have two sets of channels and sub-channels. Uh, the development environment already have uh, the AAA package and the production uh, channels doesn't have any packages. So if you go to the package, you can see we have the uh, update versions in here. Okay, so in the command line, uh, the top one uh, is the servers or the target servers and the, the bottom one is the first one is the source and the second one is the target. So in here you can see that we have the package already installed. Uh, 
and this package is part of um, the uni repositories and you can call the command and see the version that we have. So for here, you can call it the minus h and see all the available subcommands that you have and how to use it. I will use the export. And for the export, I will choose the output here. And I will choose which channel I want to export. Let me just copy the channel name. I will export the production one, so with, without any package at the moment. And let me just increase uh, the log level. So now I will start to export. So I have a wrong name. So now it's starting to export to this uh, directory in the in this machine. And you give some information. <clears throat> it will always export all the the products, um, the product that you have in this machine uh, to the target one. Okay. We have finished, so we have a new <coughs> folder in here, which is the export and contains a set of uh, files that are needed. So now I can uh, synchronize uh, this folder to the target machine. Okay, now in the target machine, I can enter in this folder, and I also have the same version installed in here, and I can run the imports. import of this folder and I should go to the web interface and see that uh, now I have this channel in the target server. Okay, for now the channel this is empty but I can also even assign this channel uh, to a minion test minion with this product installed. Can confirm, just check if the event was fired up, yeah. So now we have a, a SUS Linux Enterprise Server 15 SP2 with a set of channels assigned um, to it. Okay, so now, now let's try to use Content Lifecycle Manager and promote what we have in the development channel to the production one. <clears throat> now it's cloning the channels. It should not take too much, I hope. Yeah, it's already generating REPL metadata. And you can see that the production right have the packages that we had previously on the development. So now back again to the command line. I will remove this export folder to restart again. So I will export again. Okay, the same set of channels. And in the target server, I will take the time to remove the export. Now it will take a little bit more time because we have some packages in the channel. So We'll take some. Okay, we have it here, and now in the export, we see that an, another uh, folder has show up with the packages that need to be copied. So let's rsync again. I should see the same content in here in the target server in the bottom. So let's import again. Port has finished, and now if I move again to the target server, let's see the software, channel list, packages. I can see that that's, I have the channels updated <coughs> with the packages. 
and if I go now to the system, um, it will update the patches in the package that need to be installed. It should be taken. Yeah, it's already taken. So you can see I have an alert saying that we have failed patches to be installed, and we can install these patches. It will take a few moments to be installed. Yeah, it's running. patches are installed. The alert is still here. Um, we should wait a little bit for the task matic to kick the process that update this, but I can force it by running a software update. And in a few seconds, uh, the alert should be gone. Okay. So this is uh, the current implementation. We have the, um, the next steps. We are actively working on the next steps for this tool. And two of them are uh, be able to export uh, images and um, configuration channels. So we are actively developing these two new export mechanisms. Let me check, yeah, the system is up to date, so they already run. Okay, any questions, uh, feedback about uh, this new tool? I have one for something that could be important, especially for mm -hmm. people who is going to watch this later. What are the benefits over the old inter-server sync? I already saw some, but maybe you mm -hmm. want to make <clears throat> this explanation. Okay, so the current implementation of inter-server sync um, is triggered from the, the slave. Okay, so if you have, uh, for example, in a hub scenario where you want to have one source manager and several different source managers, uh, connected at the same time uh, to that source manager server and you want to distribute content, you are risking that all the peripheral servers will trigger the synchronization at the same time and um, you can starve the, uh, the hub server. In this scenario, you are controlling what you want to export and uh, when to export from uh, the master server. Okay, and you can export also to the and you, moment you are exporting to a local directory and you can export once and then synchronize the same contact the same content to all the servers all the peripheral servers all always the same content okay that is um, one of the benefits the uh, other one is will come later which is be able to export images uh, and the configuration channels um, and I think this is those are the main ones I'm not sure if uh, you, Julio, or if you want to add something more um, to this? Um, I think no. those are in, indeed the main ones. So the first one is we're looking at this at, from a scale perspective. So here it's important that the export process is different from the import process, so be that we don't repeat the export process for each slave. Mm -hmm. So that allows us to scale more. And, and the second is flexibility. So. Um, we are not constrained to software channels. We can cover other, potentially any kind of object that lives in the Uni server to be synced to slaves. And the first ones we are tackling are, are images and, and, container, uh, and con configuration channels. Mm -hmm. And I just remember about another one. Uh, as you can see, I, in any part of the process, I define who is this master and who is the slave. Okay, so I just want to run a command and I said, okay, I want to export uh, these channels. Then I copy the content and I run a command and say, I, I want to import what is in this folder. So if, if for some reason you define a channel in a peripheral server and want to sync it back to the, to, to the master run, you can do it. If you want to have a master uh, that is responsible to propagate all the content, but you want to have a SUS manager just for test purpose to try the channels and connect some test environments, you can define everything in there and then synchronize from that server to the one that is responsible for uh, distributing the content. So there are no notion of master and slave. We are only have a notion of exported data and imported data. And super quick question that was, uh, it seems written there on a notification. So this is also related to the UniHub in the end, right? This, 
I think this is going to be one of the parts that we need for the hub, or am I wrong? Uh, this will be an important uh, part of the hub because, well, uh, as I was saying, if you have now the configurations that you have, it, it's like, like one master and one or two slaves. But in the future, if you want to scale the uni uh, in the with the hub project, we can have thousands of uh, uni uh, servers as slaves. So for that reason, we need to be able to uh, synchronize all the data in a more uh, or a faster way and also uh, be able to synchronize more content from the master to the slave. And we decided instead of trying to enhance the current implementation of the inter-server sync, to start a new implementation and uh, tackle the problem in a, in a different direction. And instead of triggering the synchronization from the slave, we are triggering the synchronization from the master. Okay. And this is just the first version of inter-server sync. Uh, we are actively working on um, exporting images and uh, configuration channels. But in the future, uh, we uh, are also considering um, improving the synchronization mechanism. As you see right now, we are using the uh, NAR sync run by hand in the in the server that was exported. But we can also do it at with, uh, for example, with salt states or uh, a wrapper tool or something like that to um, improve the way the content is di distributed to the to the target minions. Very good. Um, Any other questions? Stephanie, I got one question. So this can theoretically also be used to migrate servers, right? Or in future at least. Um, well, uh, I think that could be, it's not planned <laughs> right now, OK? OK. But uh, uh, it's not in the roadmap at the moment. Uh, but we are now exporting channels. We are planning on exporting um, configuration channels are working actively working on exporting configuration channels and images but uh, uh, I don't see any reason that we cannot export for example uh, minions or minions information you know that needs to be checked validate and see if it's doable or not uh, but in theory we can export uh, or implement the export to, to any entity that exists in the this is managed. yeah I'm just thinking in terms of rebuilding OS migrating to different OS or newer versions and starting a server from scratch I mean, not really. It's not in the current design goals, uh, unless all you need from a server is just the software channels and configuration channels and images. But I don't expect that to be to be your use case. I mean, in principle, the, the concept can be stretched to some degree. I'm not entirely sure if it would be worth it to stretch it to yeah. the point to cover all, all the needs of, of such a scenario. Okay, but I, I think that's a good start because I personally care more about the configurations and the configuration channels. They are not so nice to copy and paste over. Thanks. Um, one more technical question, actually. Um, I've noticed that uh, this package is based on a bit of an, let's say, no, not the latest Golang version, as far as I understood. Um, does it actually run on Golang 15 or 1.15, or is it restricted to that? Uh, yeah, detail? yeah. I mean, uh, Golang is is, is is backwards compatible in terms of syntax, so it will it will compile on newer Golang versions just fine. Uh, I okay. actually think I developed the last um, last time with a with a fresher Golang, even though it might not be um, packaged or the Golang used to compile it. Uh, when we distribute it, but that's not a problem. And of course, uh, yeah, Golang projects uh, ultimately end up in one big executable that doesn't need any, any interpreter or any, any library actually from the running system. They are standalone. So once it's packaged, you don't have to care really. Okay, thanks. I just noticed it in the spec file that it was uh, fixed to that version. Thanks. Welcome. Yeah, I seem to remember that the reason for this spec is so then, but this is more maybe too technical. It's so we don't need to specify at the project config at open build service what exact version should be used because then you will need to start filling the project config with prefers. Mm -hmm. I see. OK. 
Okay, if no more questions, then thank you for your time and uh, back to you, Julio. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for the presentation and all the replies. So last topic of today is Cedric and pacemaker support for KVM and Xen virtual machines. Roar is yours. So can you see my browser? Yes, we can see a new unit server, web UI. Cool. So hi, everyone. Uh, I have no slides. Uh, here is just demo. And uh, hopefully I prayed enough the uh, demo gods to for it to go right to the end. So here I have set up um, a, a SUSE um, a Slits HA cluster. Uh, it's you can set it up using OpenSUSE as well. Um, probably other distros as well. I haven't tested with them. At least for uh, an HA noob like me, uh, it's easier to do it with prepackaged things like that. Um, here we have two nodes. Uh, one is demo KVM1 dem and the other is demo KVM2. I have set up an OCFS2 uh, storage that is uh, shared across all the nodes. Uh, this OCFS2 storage will be used to store the um, disk images of the virtual machines, but also the um, VM configuration files. Um, I'm, I did that easily, uh, that e this easily, just one storage for them all, but technically you don't really need ocfs2 to store xml files it's just uh, nfs uh, should just do and you see here that i already have a vm uh, that i created earlier here my systems uh, so i created them in the system group is just to make it easier to to deploy uh, but deploying the um Deploying this is not uh, the purpose of uh, of this uh, demo. There are still some uh, non-published code, well, not released code um, for the cluster formula to make it work to the end. But uh, you get the ID to get um, one cluster formula and the virtualization formula applied to all the, the systems and, and there you go. Um, the interesting bit uh, here, well, it's not um, in, in the uh, configuration here, but OCFS2 by default in the uh, CRM um, in it is mounted on SRV cluster FS on all the nodes. And here I use that path for the default storage pool for libvirt. So Remember that bit, this will be important later. Now our two systems, they're here, they're um, SLE, um, SLES for SAP um, repos. Just uh, SLES for HA could work. It's just a major, minor packaging issue. Um, here I have the virtualization tab for the KVM1. And you see the VM1 here. I have the same here for KVM2, but you're not seeing the VM because it's not running on that system. Let's create a guest here. Call it VM2. I will reduce the memory amount a little bit because uh, it's a little big. So you hear, you see here the enable UFI feature uh, that Julio just mentioned. I will not play with it today because I realized during the um, the, the community hour that I missed to deploy um, the state state file modifications for that, and I don't want to break the demo. But um, you see the the UI here. Technically, um, here is a recent enough libvirt, so just. Checking the box will be enough. It will automatically discover the uh, firmware and, and template. But if you have a SLE 15 SP1 and below, or equivalent OpenSUSE, or even older, old um, CentOS or whatever, 
you will need to specify the firmware and the template. So I will uncheck that thing here. Here, just uh, SRV cluster FS. So this is the past the path to the um, XML definition. So if you mount it on NFS, you can just uh, put that path here. And here I select the default storage pool. So you just need to ensure that this storage pool is shared across all the nodes, because otherwise uh, you will break the migration. And I'll just give an image template here. And let's go create it. So it usually, it may take some time and uh, depend on when Taskomatic is wanting to pick up the action. And sadly, I cannot, I cannot make it faster. We should maybe implement a refresh button here, right? Um, we should implement a, a kick, a, a kick, um, kick action fast. <laughs> here is the uh, the taskomatic that um, has the action, and and taskomatic decides when to pick it up. Um, for some reason, here is not picked up yet. It, the UI will refresh automatically when when it will be picked, but uh, here <laughs> I have to wait for some. There you go. Let's open the console. We'll be starting. So you see the VM starting, and here on Hawk you have uh, the VM that is defined here, and there is also um, a constraint that is added. Uh, where is it? Uh, cluster configuration. Where is it? Constraints here. So there is a constraint that is added on the OCFS2 clone so that we ensure that the OCFS2 uh, resource is up before starting the, uh, the VM. So now we, are, we have the VM up and running. Let's go login in, run top here. And now we we have this migrate button that is only for clustered VMs. Uh, I can select one of the other nodes of the cluster and click the migrate button. The action status is in, is here. Um, a green but a green here doesn't mean the migration is completed. It means that the action has been initiated. And you see here it's initiated by by the cluster, but it do take some time to um, to be done. And here I have defined a fairly small VM with just the minimum amount of memory. You can imagine that if you have huge memory amount, it takes a lot of time. Um, so here uh, there is one thing that is critical um, in, in the um, migration step here, the two nodes of my cluster are strictly identical. So same hardware. This means that um, to migrate, there will be no issue. But if you have nodes with different hardwares, different CPU capabilities and so on, you may get into troubles. So the lesson here is just like with any um, virtual machine migration, just ensure that uh, the, the source and target uh, hosts are compatible. So here we on the demo two, we already see the um, the new VM, the VM two that is arriving, but it's in state stopped. Here is still on the KVM one but it's in state running. Uh, the idea is that during a live migration, Libvirt will create a uh, VM on target, pose it, 
do the migration of the mem the memory um, data, and once the, the memory is all migrated and in sync and and everything, it switches off the the first one and boots the other one. There, the VM two is off. It's running here. And we need to refresh the page. <laughs> Usually, sh normally it should not, but demo issue. <laughs> and you see that our top is still running, and uh, the the VM has been migrated live. Um, well, this is this is it, and maybe you have questions now. I have one. If you can go to the uh, yeah now the, uh, the the list of VMs is refreshed, of course, and we don't see the uh, the action status for the machine as uh, with the green tick, right? That thing that you mentioned that having here the green sign does not mean that the action was successfully complete. Of course, it's it means that it's only started. Maybe we should consider using a different icon because for me that looks like the users would think that yeah action is complete already indeed or at least a help bubble so if you hover on top of mm -hmm. the icon at least you see that hey 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 this means that this was just started it's not complete maybe yeah it could be um yeah good point But other than that, I, I really think this is, yeah, very nice. And it's good to see that the live migration, well, it, it was just working as expected. And uh, here, maybe we can stop a VM. Um, same here, it may take some time. Um, but uh, when the VM is stopped, the magic with, um, with the cluster is that um, the VM are not defined on libvirt. On the libvirt side, the VMs are transient. So this means that uh, at every um, display of the page, we need to ask the cluster which VMs do you have and that we don't know about on libvirt. So here you see uh, the VM one, and you will see here it here on the other nodes, it stopped, but you can st start it from any any node here, and the um, the thing that is uh, still not updated yet, if you go to the virtual systems here. Oh, I thought it was I thought it was not showing up, but it is showing up. At least it used to to be hidden here. <laughs> so it may happen that stop VMs are not defined and not show appearing here. Or well, but they could, if they, this they could is working under... now, it should work, right, Cedric? Pardon? If this is working now for this stopped instance, then it should work in the other cases, or why shouldn't it? Uh, it should work, but since I have no real idea why it works, I wouldn't bet it will work in all cases. <laughs> because okay. normally, since the VM is not uh, registered to, um, it's not a registered system, there is no nothing remaining in the database uh, once the VM is stopped. Normally, mm, and understood. if the VM is registered, it should show under unknown host. So I will need to to see that uh, to, to troubleshoot that to see if it's uh, a, a cool bug um, or uh, <laughs> or if it's a feature. Other questions? If there are no further questions, then we still have, yeah, seven, six minutes so you can ask anything else or make suggestions from the community. 
Don't be shy and just ask us. I got a question, uh, a principal question, actually. I'm sure it's out there already, but I couldn't find it yet. And this is regarding bootstrapping, because I'm pretty uh, new to the whole concept. Um, I've got a client registered uh, via an Uyuni server, um, via the bootstrap method. But now I want to move this client to a different um, to a different master because obviously I've deleted the new one uh, or the current one, so I can rebuild it. Um, what's really the uh, the process behind it? Because I seem to be able to bootstrap the new client, but it doesn't actually show up anywhere. So I've replaced certificates and I've deleted folders on the client, um, and I don't get any error, other error messages in the logs or anything like that. So I'm not sure how it works technically in the background. Mainly, uh, so uh, it's configuration on the Salt Minion side. Uh, so uh, there is uh, in the um, Salt Minion .d, I think, is it called to the manager conf or master conf? Um, there is a pointer where you specify which master to use. Yeah. Um, then we have, um, there is the salt, etc salt PKI directory yeah. where all the certificates are. So when you switch the master, then you have a new, new uh, thing. So that means I think best is, I think you remove that directory yeah. uh, and then you need to just restart the salt minion. It will connect again to the new salt master. Then you need to accept the key there. Uh, and then the deployment. Uh, should start automatically. So in, in principle, the whole bootstrapping is only about making uh, this configuration to the salt minion and then um, starting it up. And as soon as you um, accept the key, uh, then uh, an, how is it called? Salt start event uh, yeah. is triggered. And the, uh, we are re reacting on, on this salt start event. And then all the process is going. We are fetching grains. We are uh, setting up the system inside uh, of the Zuse manager database. We are applying states, bootstrap states, and uh, and later then also the high state or, or special states when needed. So, um, so this is a uh, principle, the uh, way how all this bootstrapping works. So I should really look on the uh, on the master um, if if the if it's not showing up. It sounds like it. Yeah. So I think then maybe you will find something in the master logs. Okay. Good. Thank you. So, I just wanted the principle yeah. behind it because it, it's confusing me. <laughs> yeah. Most probably. So well, could be also a not accepted salt key. So. Yeah, that's what it was initially. <laughs> oh, now you're laughing there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, what what it was initially, and eventually all the keys are there, and um, the, the bootstrap is connecting successfully to the minion. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll have a look there. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions or suggestions? Something you want to discuss? If no one else has a question, I have one last question on my list regarding Cobbler and the strategy on this one. Um, I notice at the moment you're running Cobbler 3.1. Um, was it uh, Red Hat is using 3.2? Are you sticking to 3.1 or so? Because I want, uh, especially regarding, um, uh, was it Alma Linux and Rocky Linux? I have pushed some changes to the um, Cobbler ups upstream or master. Uh, to the different versions, and I'm not actually really sure where to push it or how to make it work. So um, we are currently working uh, on um, up updating Cobbler in Uyuni, um, um, but I think we will update to version 3.3, which is currently in development. The good okay. thing is we have the um, now the upstream maintainer of Cobbler in our team. Yeah, I already heard. <laughs> And this is his first task. <laughs> okay, so so I'd be looking at master there. Yeah. That's cool. Thanks. That's it from my side. Very good. If there are no more things we want to discuss, then thank you everyone for attending.
we will have the next session in one month. I will send the invitation in the next week, I hope. And if you want to know when the EU unit 202108 is expected, then I would say in the first half of the month, it should be ready. We are still fixing some problems that we detected with the test suite, but as always, as soon as it is ready, you will get all the announcements on the Gitter, the Twitter website, email, etc., etc. So stay tuned. Thank you very much, everyone. And of course, enjoy the upcoming weekend. See you next time. Bye all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.